on World News Tonight. BBC probed. India's tax officers search BBC's Indian headquarters following the Modi documentary controversy. New competition. Nikki Haley applies as a presidential candidate for the GOP for 2024, adding the competition burden for Donald Trump. Losing streak. Vladimir Zelensky urges the West to send in more ammunition as Ukraine crumbles under Russian advancements. Doggy runway. Furry friends join models on the New York Fashion Week runway. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News where we bring you the latest updates from around the planet. More wars hit cyclone struck New Zealanders as tens of thousands have been shaken by a 6.3 magnitude earthquake centered near Wellington tonight. Described by some as massive and scary, the quake started with a large jolt followed by at least 30 seconds of moderate shaking. Almost 70,000 Kiwis had reported feeling the quake, including in Auckland and Christchurch. One resident of Garden City described it as a rolling sensation as opposed to jolty. The National Emergency Management Agency has advised there is no tsunami threat. The Wellington Region Emergency Management Office said aftershocks should be expected. A short time later, another earthquake, this one magnitude 4.0, hit 45 kilometers southwest of Tamarunui and at the depth of 78 kilometers. There were no immediate reports of damage and no tsunami warning was issued, but residents reported feeling the ground shaking for 10 to 20 seconds, likening it to a convoy of giant trucks rolling by. The quake came as the cleanup got underway from a devastating cyclone which killed four people and caused widespread damage across the North Island. The earthquake is the second natural disaster to hit New Zealand in a matter of days after Cyclone Gabrielle caused the worst damage in a generation according to Prime Minister Chris Hipkins and killed four people. Now, the BBC's officers in Mumbai and Delhi were searched by Indian tax officers weeks after the government banned a documentary by the broadcaster that was critical of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Crowds gathered outside the BBC's New Delhi offices on Tuesday as Indian tax officers searched the broadcaster's bureaus there and in Mumbai. The move comes as the government cracks down on streaming and sharing a BBC documentary critical of Prime Minister Narendra Modi over his role in deadly riots in 2002. A foreign ministry spokesperson last month dismissed the program as propaganda. We think this is a, a propaganda piece uh, designed to push a particular discredited narrative. Um, the bias, a lack of objectivity, and frankly a continuing colonial mindset is blatantly visible. Last month, more than a dozen students were detained in the capital for trying to screen the film. The program is called India, the Modi Question, and it focuses on the Hindu nationalist politician's leadership as chief minister of the western state of Gujarat in February 2002. Riots at the time left at least a thousand people dead, most of them Muslims. Activists say the number is more than double that. During his career, Modi has been dogged by accusations he didn't do enough to stop the rioting. He's always denied wrongdoing. Government critics decried the tax-related search of the BBC. An opposition politician said it reeks of desperation and shows that the Modi government is scared of criticism. Modi's party, the BJP, said Indian institutions worked independently and the tax department was within the law in looking into tax compliance. As well as India's opposition, media rights advocates have also condemned Tuesday searches. And Britain's foreign office said it was keeping a close eye on reports. Meanwhile, online searches for India Narendra Modi documentary surged globally in the wake of Tuesday's news. As for the BBC, it said it's standing by its reporting, cooperating with tax officials, and remains committed to serving audiences in India. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley announced today that she will run for president in 2024. Former Vice President Mike Pence is also expected to run and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is still facing questions about whether or not he'll jump in as well. Nikki Haley making it official. I'm running for president. In a video, the former South Carolina governor touting her roots in the state. I was born and raised in South Carolina, so I have seen the very best of our country. 
a first-generation American story. I was the proud daughter of Indian immigrants. And while not naming her competition, taking what seemed like digs at former President Trump. It's time for a new generation of leadership. I don't put up with bullies. And when you kick back, it hurts them more if you're wearing heels. Trump's one-time ambassador to the United Nations, now his first official challenger, though likely not the last. Former Vice President Mike Pence is also expected to run. Today, a source familiar with his plans, he'll resist a subpoena to testify in the special counsel investigation of Mr. Trump's denial of the 2020 election results. And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis asked today when and if he'll jump in. Wouldn't you like to know? Now, the Norfolk Southern Railway train delayed earlier in the month, spilling several toxic chemicals from five derail tankers in the Ohio town. The crash and successive cleanup have East Palestinians worried about water and air contamination, with some locals reporting that their animals are becoming sick or dying. Railway company Norfolk Southern will stay at the site of a train derailment in Ohio where toxic chemicals were released until, quote, absolutely everything is clean. That's what Ohio's Governor Mike DeWine said on Tuesday after the incident forced nearly 2,000 residents to be evacuated. Norfolk Southern is responsible for this problem. Uh, we fully expect them uh, to live up to what the CEO committed to me, and that is that they will pay for everything. Uh, if they don't, we run attorney general here and it will file a lawsuit. So, look, they're responsible for this. They did it. Um, you know, uh, this is a, a, you know, the impact on this community is huge. The fiery wreck almost two weeks ago, filmed on amateur video, saw 38 freight cars jump the rails near the town of East Palestine, Ohio. At least 10 of those carry dangerous chemicals like vinyl chloride. It's a highly flammable compound and is carcinogenic when inhaled. Crews drained and burned off the toxic chemicals, and residents were told it was safe to return to their homes. DeWine said not enough attention was given to the train with its troubling cargo on board. Even though some rail cars did have hazardous material on board, uh, and while most of them did not, that's why it was not categorized as a high hazardous material train. Uh, frankly, uh, if this is true, and I'm told it's true, uh, this is absurd uh, and we need to look at this uh, and Congress needs to take a, take a look at how these things are handled. Railroad union officials say they had warned that cost cutting could lead to a breakdown in safety measures and to accidents like this. Responding to the accusations, Norfolk Southern said in an email that their record is trending safer. Ohio authorities said chemicals had spilled into local waterways. But the governor and state officials played down health risks from pollution to the Ohio River, which 5 million people depend on for drinking water. Tiffany Kavalek is chief of the Surface Water Division of the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. But the Ohio River is very large. And it's a water body that's able to dilute the pollutants pretty quickly. State officials said residents near the derailment should only use bottled water as authorities wait for more test results. Now, the European Parliament has given a green light to a plan to halt sales of petrol and diesel cars from 2035. It's a crucial part of the bloc's plan to become a climate neutral economy and a global leader in clean technology by 2050. Parliament is closed. And with that, a landmark law cleared a final legislative hurdle. The EU Parliament officially banning the sale of new gas and diesel-powered vehicles in the EU starting in 2035. Ahead of the vote, supporters said the law was needed to speed up the switch to electric vehicles and to combat climate change. In addition to the total phase-out of gas-powered cars and vans in 2035, the law also requires a 55 percent cut in CO2 emissions for new cars sold from 2030 compared to 2021 levels. But opponents, led by conservative MEPs, argued that the industry was not ready for such a dramatic step and that the move put hundreds of thousands of jobs at risk. But the market is already making the switch. Volkswagen, for example, has said it will only produce electric vehicles in Europe starting in 2033. 
The new law covers cars and vans and not trucks and buses. With that in mind, the European Commission unveiled plans Tuesday to require urban buses in the EU to be zero carbon emitting by 2030 and to slash emissions from new trucks sold from 2040. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now to Turkey and Syria, where amazingly, survivors are still being found after last week's earthquakes. But there are also concerns about the 7 million children the UN says were impacted by the disaster. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. Miraculous moments in Turkey. Rescuers pulled an 18-year-old from the rubble of collapsed buildings on Tuesday, eight days after a devastating earthquake hit the region. They also managed to save a 17-year-old, according to officials and local media. There were two of at least nine people rescued on Tuesday, among them a 65-year-old man and a woman who had spent over 200 hours buried in debris. <laughs> We'll save you, let me see you, says a rescuer to the man. The combined death toll in Turkey and neighboring Syria exceeds 41,000. The disaster ravaged cities in both countries, leaving many survivors homeless in near freezing winter temperatures. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan has acknowledged problems in the initial response to the 7.8 magnitude quake that struck early on February 6th, but has said the situation is now under control. The earthquake knocked out water treatment, sewage, and vital infrastructure. A World Health Organization representative warned this could lead to a health crisis atop the humanitarian disaster. Survivors joined a mass exodus from earthquake hit zones, leaving their homes and unsure if they can ever come back. Erdogan said more than 2.2 million people have left the worst hit areas already and hundreds of thousands of buildings have become uninhabitable. Now turning to the war in Ukraine. With ammunition running low and U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin vowing to get Ukraine more of it, it's an urgent issue for Ukraine as Russia steps up its new offensive. No announcements on aircraft, but Ukraine's allies pledged to give as much ammunition as possible as NATO defense ministers met in Brussels. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said Ukraine was preparing a counteroffensive in the spring and the alliance was focused on making sure Kiev had the firepower, armor and logistics to make it effective. It's a monumental task to bring all those systems together, uh, get the troops trained on those platforms and make sure we have sustainment for, that, for, for all of those systems and get those systems into the fight. So that's, that's really the focus of our, our, of our conversation today. On the battlefield in Bakhmut, Moscow is digging in its heels, with the bulk of Russia's resources directed at the key eastern city. The regional governor told local media that not one square meter in the city was safe from Russian fire and drones. According to Washington, Russia's progress has been slow, and with newly drafted soldiers poorly trained and ill-equipped, the casualty rate is high. On Tuesday, NATO pledged to keep ammunition flowing to Kiev after Alliance chief Jens Stoltenberg said the Ukrainians were going through shells much faster than allies could produce them. Plus, Ukraine could soon need more munitions than ever, amid concern Russia could ramp up its offensive. Now, the World Health Organization has intensified surveillance after Equatorial Guinea confirmed an outbreak of the Marburg virus, a highly infectious and deadly disease similar to Ebola, which killed nine people in the African country. Equatorial Guinea has confirmed its first outbreak of the highly infectious and deadly Marburg virus. That, the World Health Organization said on Monday, follows the deaths of at least nine people. Speaking on state television, Health Minister Mito Ondo Ayakaba said samples sent to an Institute Pasteur laboratory in Senegal had come back positive for Marburg, which is similar to Ebola. La enfermedad por el causada por el virus. The illness caused by the Marburg virus is serious and fatal. Este virus causa una fiebre hemorrágica. 
This virus causes a serious hemorrhagic fever in people. The death rate can reach 88%. To give you an idea, the death rate of COVID-19 didn't reach 2%. Currently, there is no preventative vaccine. The minister said the nine deaths have been linked to a funeral ceremony in Ki and Tem province. Local health authorities initially reported an unknown illness causing hemorrhagic fever cases on February the 7th. In addition to the nine deaths, Equatorial Guinea has reported 16 suspected cases of Marburg virus, with symptoms including fever, fatigue and blood-stained vomit and diarrhoea, the WHO said. People have been quarantined and movement restricted in Key and Tem. Neighbouring Cameroon has also restricted movement along its border amid concerns about contagion. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's daughter Kim ju ae has been in the spotlight recently. Her increasing number of public appearances combined with the regime's efforts to idolize the child is raising speculations that young Kim may one day succeed her father. But experts say there may be more to her ascension into the public eye. The North Korean leader's daughter Kim ju ae has become the focus of attention around the world in recent days. Kim, who's believed to be around nine years old, has recently made more public appearances with her father, Kim Jong-un. Last week, she was spotted at the 75th founding anniversary of the regime's army, walking the red carpet alongside her father and talking playfully with the leader. This comes in sharp contrast with where Kim's sister, Kim Yo-jong, was reportedly standing, as the unification ministry said that while she attended the parade, she appeared to be standing in a corner behind rows of soldiers, far from Kim Jong-un's family. Kim ju ae was first introduced to the media last November. Back then, state media described her as an adorable and noble daughter. However, now, the child is being referred to as the respected one. North Korea has recently been striving to idolize its leader's daughter as well. And on Tuesday, the regime unveiled new stamp designs featuring Kim ju ae for the first time. The new designs feature images of her attending the test firing of a Hwasong-17 ICBM last November. Out of a total eight stamps, five include images of Kim ju ae with her father. The regime is also reportedly forcing people who have the same name as the leader's daughter to change their name. Citing multiple unnamed sources, Radio Free Asia last week reported that authorities in Pyongyang summoned women with the name Kim ju ae and ordered them to change their names. North Korea is known to have prohibited its people from using the same names as its leaders. The recent spotlight on the leader's daughter has also raised questions over the possibility of her becoming Kim Jong-un's successor. But experts say it is too early to tell. Likewise, a researcher at the Institute for National Security Strategy said Kim ju ae symbolizes North Korea's future generations and that her appearances at military events imply that North Korea's military power is centered on protecting the lives and safety of future generations. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Fashion house Louis Vuitton said it has hired Pharrell Williams to head artistic direction of its menswear designs, tapping a popular figure from the music industry to fill the high-profile position left vacant since the passing of star designer Virgil Abloh over a year ago. BTS member Suga will be the first of the group to hold a solo world tour. He is set to tour five locations in the States before moving on to Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, Seoul and Japan. F1's oldest team, Scuderia Ferrari, unveiled their 2023 Challenger with Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz testing the car out on track, saying they were confident in the car this year, despite saying the same last year where they came in as runners-up. Qatari investors are preparing to make a bid to buy Premier League club Manchester United in the coming days. The report, added that the consortium will submit an initial bid for the club by the end of the week and that officials from Qatar Sports Investments are helping with preparations for the bid. Russia's defence ministry released footage of its two U-160 heavy strategic bombers conducting routine flights. The ministry said the flights were performed over neutral waters of the Barents and Norway seas. The two Tupolev Tu-160 aircraft, which can carry up to 12 short-range nuclear missiles, were in the air for over 13 hours.
that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Now, humankind's best friends stole the show at Elysian Impact's inaugural catwalk for a baby fashion show. We leave you tonight with designers, models, rescue animals and charities coming together for a great show. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.